Welcome ladies and gentlemen to another video, this one kindly sponsored by World of Warships. In this video we're going to be looking at Bismarck and what could have been done a little bit better and of course in World of Warships you can actually play Bismarck and see if you can command her a little bit better so she doesn't die on her maiden voyage. And unlike in real life of course being a video game in World of Warships if you do happen to manage to get yourself killed in your first battle with Bismarck well you can just go back into another one and try again. There are a bunch of rather interesting textures available for Bismarck as well, including one that's based on what her appearance probably was when she was out on her last voyage, and a slight variant on that, which is a weathered version, which is more akin to what she was probably like at the end of that voyage. There's also alternative designs to Bismarck, and ships that were designed contemporary with Bismarck, whether built or unbuilt, which you can find in-game. There's a graphics update coming out around about the time that this video goes live. And if you use the code WARSHIPS, which is in the video description down below, then if you're a new player, you can get a bunch of gold doubloons, 500, 2 million credits, that's the regular currency, 7 days free premium time, and after you've played 15 battles, you'll get a free ship as well. So, thanks very much to World of Warships for sponsoring this video. And now, on with the redesign of Bismarck. Hello everyone! Those fine folk over on Patreon decided that, well, Drac, you've talked about Bismarck so many times and how you don't like the design from an engineering perspective of efficiency, so put your money where your mouth is and tell us how you'd do it. So that's what we're going to do now. Unfortunately, amongst my talents is not suddenly become an entire German capital ship design bureau, and considering it took that design bureau several years to finalise the design for Bismarck, I'm not going to be producing anything like the same level of drawings and details and plans and briefing documents that the original designers did. Hopefully you understand. But what we're instead going to do is look at three major design changes that I personally would make, and then a few smaller design changes, which I would also like to see, but are not necessarily quite as significant as the big ones. And we're also going to discuss perhaps one or two things which could be changed, which would make for an overall better ship, but could probably be left because it's not going to manifestly affect things in, of course, what historically was Bismarck's only mission. And I'm also going to go through them in an approximate order of likelihood, i.e. if someone had shown up in the middle of 1930s Germany and gone, hey guys, I think we should do Bismarck slightly differently, this is my idea, how likely is that to be accepted? The most likely we'll go with first, and the least likely we'll leave last, at least in my opinion. Now, of course, we do have the benefit of hindsight informing this entire process. So some things that are perhaps obvious to us now, or were at least obvious in hindsight, perhaps after the loss of Bismarck or after the Second World War, may not have been quite so obvious to them. And of course there are other factors such as what the Kriegsmarine thought Bismarck was going to end up doing, which might then have influenced a choice where they did have several different choices about what to do, and in my opinion they chose the suboptimal choice. And so those factors explain why the historical choice was made instead of the one that I'm going to take, because there were reasons for the design choices made on Bismarck, even if they weren't necessarily particularly good ones. So how are we going to do this? Well, I'm going to tell you what the changes are and why I'm making them, and we're going to plug those changes into the wonderful program Springshot, which actually has a relatively recent beta. It's actually up to beta 3.4, I think, but 3.2 is the latest one that I believe comes with all the little test ship files, I pre-program historical ship designs, and since they've included an original flavour Bismarck in there, we're going to start from there and see what the program kicks out as the changes to the ship. Of course, Springshop is ultimately still just a computer program, so its final results may not 110% reflect the exact reality of things, but it's a pretty decent program, and at least at the capital ship scale, it works pretty well. So, you know, we're going to be in a fairly small ballpark for the correct figures, so it'll give you a pretty decent shot at what the design changes I'm proposing would actually have on the ship as a whole. 
and I'll be using World of Warships with their Bismarck 3D model to show some shots of how the ship would have looked around about the time of her sailing. And then I'll also be using Ultimate Animal Dreadnoughts to construct a hopefully vaguely passable Bismarck model, which will serve to better illustrate the more significant design changes at least. So let's press on with design change number one. The secondary battery, good grief, did that thing cause so many problems. And, uh, well, for the major design changes, we're focused purely on the heavy caliber secondary battery. We'll come to the 37mm later. As you will probably know by now, the Bismarck had a mixed secondary battery of 150mm or 5.9 inch guns and 105mm or 4.1 inch guns. And this was because the 150 mils, uh, the 5.9 inches, there are a total of a dozen of those. Those are the anti-surface battery. And the 105 mils are the dedicated anti-aircraft battery, or at least the heavy anti-aircraft battery. The reason for this split was why Yamato and Littorio also launched with mixed secondaries. And the Richelieu's ended up having to launch with mixed secondaries, as did Dunkirk and Strasbourg. Although in their cases they were attempting to go for dual purpose batteries, it just turned out the dual purpose battery didn't quite work as well as they thought. And it was simply that the approximately four inch calibre, which was held to be a very good anti-aircraft calibre, depending on which particular ship you found it on, was considered to be just a little bit too light to do major damage to mid to late 1930s destroyers with a single hit. And the secondaries were still looking at, can we stop a destroyer with one or two hits? The six inch, give or take a little bit, was seen as more than powerful enough to cause serious problems for a destroyer and perhaps even be quite useful as a secondary in an engagement with a heavier vessel like a cruiser or another battleship. But attempts by some nations to make dual purpose six inch guns on the in interwar side of World War II failed. And other nations looked at it and just went, no, this isn't even worth trying. And so you had a choice for the US and the UK. That was to develop a new gun. The US developed the 5-inch 38. The British developed the 4.5-inch and the 5.25-inch. But Germany, along with the other nations mentioned earlier, decided we're just going to have some of each kind of gun. Unfortunately, Bismarck's implementation of this idea apart from the idea itself, in my opinion, being somewhat flawed, was pretty terrible. The Scharnhorst, of course, was the preceding German battleship design. And you might think, well, surely Bismarck would have a greater secondary battery than Scharnhorst. And technically, you would be correct. Both ships have the same anti-surface secondary battery of 12 5.9 inch guns in six twin turrets, three on each side, and both carry the 4.1 inch or 105 millimeter anti-aircraft gun. Scharnhorst carries 14 of them in seven twin mountings, and Bismarck carries 16 of them in eight twin mountings. So surely we've got a win here, Drac? No, actually they have the same effective anti-aircraft broadside because all of Bismarck's are mounted on the sides. So you have four twin mounts per side, whereas Scharnhorst, although it's one twin mount down, compensates for this by having the aft twin mount super firing over the aft triple 11 inch which means it has three twins per side plus that one at the back which means actually both ships Schoenhaus and Bismarck can put eight barrels of 105 millimeter shells downrange at incoming aircraft at a distance. Now let's compare that to the treaty equivalents and we're briefly touch on the King George V and North Carolina class, but they are dual purpose using ships. King George V, of course, is equipped with eight twin 5.25 inch mounts. So in the anti-surface role, it can put down eight barrels compared to Bismarck six. Admittedly, the, the 150mm is slightly bigger than the 5.25, but hey, two more shells. And in the anti-aircraft role, they can put out eight barrels for Bismarck and eight barrels for King George V because they both have four twins pointing on either side. And of course, the 5.25 inch is bigger, so that's a bigger shell going a longer distance. You can start to kind of see the problem. When it gets to North Carolina, the problem gets even worse because with the 5 inch 38, there are 20 guns in five twin mounts, 10 
get barrels per side, which of course means that North Carolina can put 10 barrels of heavy anti-air into the air, and they are heavier than the 105s, plus there's two more of them, and there's four more barrels going in the anti-surface roll compared to the 150 mils, albeit again, yes, the uh, 150 mil is slightly heavier, but four more barrels this time. And well, we're going to discount the amateur because that's a slightly unfair comparison because she's so, so large. But if we look at the other two ostensibly 35,000 ton treaty battleships with mixed secondaries, so that's Richelieu and Latorio. Well, Richelieu, as planned, if their dual purpose six inch had worked out, would have had a broadside of nine guns for heavy AA and for anti surface. And of course, that would have been. One more barrel, but with considerably heavier shells in the anti-aircraft roll, and three more barrels of approximately equal shells in the anti-surface roll. Uh, that would have been obviously partially done by exploiting the fact that Richelieu is all forward, which meant she could mount at least one of her triple six inch on the back. As it was, even having to emergency scrap part of that battery because they had to go with a mixed battery because the six inch turned out to not be dual purpose, Richelieu still, even with a rather inefficient emergency installation, still manages to match Bismarck's heavy anti-surface firepower with six barrels per side, and almost matches Bismarck's anti-air profile by just sticking in half a dozen twin 100 mil gun mounts where the two forward triple 152s were going to be. Now, okay, that's only six barrels downrange, but post-war, Jean Barr showed what could be done if you actually stopped and thought about this idea on a Richelieu-type hull for a minute and managed to put 12 twin 100 mils down. So you've got, again, the same anti-surface heavy firepower, except now because you've got 12 twins, that means 12 barrels per side, which means 50% more heavy anti-aircraft guns in a similar calibre compared to Bismarck. And of course, Richelieu is 6,000 tonnes lighter. In fact, the only treaty period battleship which comes out with a slightly worse secondary battery than Bismarck is the Littorios, at least in terms of barrel numbers, and that's because of some of the design choices they made regarding the placement of the aft triple turret, which meant that although they have the same number of heavy anti-ship secondaries, i.e. 12 barrels, in four triples rather than six twins, they only have the same broadside of six guns, and because they go with with their 90 mil heavy anti-aircraft guns with relatively space inefficient single mounts they only have six barrels per side as opposed to the eight on Bismarck although as I said this is partly because of Italian design choices if for example they'd invented a twin 90 mil they could have fitted more twin 90 mils in the space they allocated than the individual barrels that they did and if they'd had the aft triple 15 inch on the lower position rather than the upper position, then they could either have stuck in another center line triple six, which would have given them three additional barrels, or they could have ditched one of the existing triple sixes and stuck the other one on the center line, which would have maintained a six gun secondary broadside, but with three less barrels. So all of this is to say, I would go to a dual purpose main battery. Now, in an ideal world, I would like this to be a uniform 128 millimeter battery, but unfortunately, whilst a 120 millimeter dual purpose gun was in the works for the Kriegsmarine, due to circumstances at the time, it was not ready until pretty much during the war. And so that is the slightly less likely of the two potential unified secondary batteries. Much as I would like it, and much as if, to be honest, if you were starting back when Bismarck was being designed initially, you said, no, we are going to have a dual purpose battery, and I want that 128mm gun, which was already being fitted on German destroyers, to be adapted to dual purpose for my ships. You probably could have got it done, but since we're going with what would have been the easiest path, just take the existing 105s. When the mounts work, they're perfectly serviceable anti-aircraft guns. And yes, admittedly, if a single 105mm shell probably won't stop a destroyer cold in a general case scenario, but look on the bright side, you now have a battery of great extent, in fact, if you just do a like-for-like like replacement, i.e. you swap out the 12 5.9s for 
12 additional 4.1s, you now have a secondary battery that consists of no less than 28 barrels. 14 per side, that's four more barrels than a US fast battleship. That's almost twice as many as a King George V, at which stage, yeah, the fact that it's not necessarily going to stop a destroyer with a single shell probably doesn't matter because you're probably going to be hitting them with a lot more than one shell. <laughs> and the added advantage of that, of course, is that that's the absolute minimal change because that's just replacing the twin 5.9s with twin 4.1s. The twin 4.1s weigh considerably less. They take up less space. Their blast radius is less as well. And so I think you probably especially if you streamlined the superstructure since you're not having to make the quite as deep an indent into the superstructure as you did for the 5.9 inch, you could probably, by thinning the aft superstructure down a little, maybe even get another set of twins in, which would give you no less than 16 barrels per side, i.e. eight twin mounts per side, which would be really, really good. But since we're going down a conservative line, uh, for at least for the beginning, we're going to say just replace those six 152 twins with six 105 twins and call the job a good one. In fact, I rather suspect if you reprofiled the midship superstructure a little bit and just used 105s, you could even get the alternate two-tier stacking arrangement like you do with the American 5-inch 38s and probably for even more guns on there, but we'll leave that to one side for the minute. Now, what effect does this all have on the ship's displacement? Well, it turns out not a huge amount. Obviously, we have made the ship fractionally lighter, but not by any real amount worth writing home about. However, in terms of spring shot, for those of you who understand how spring shot works, our hull strength has gone up. So the basic Bismarck design, at least as it's in uh, spring shot, has a cross-sectional hull strength of 0.99, longitudinal strength of 1.09, and overall 1.0. And for those of you who don't use spring shot, 1.0 is about what you want to aim for. And our new design has a cross-sectional strength of 1.03, a longitudinal strength of 1.13, and an overall 1.04. So it's a somewhat stronger design. Not really all that much to it, but the main thing is we have a dramatically improved chance in anti-aircraft warfare, and of course we can just smother our opponents in anti-surface warfare. Now, the next of our three design changes which is probably going to be the most controversial one with people these days and probably would be the second most controversial one at the time, and that's the armor scheme. I've mentioned before the many, 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 many reservations I have with Bismarck's armor scheme, and without rehashing that entire argument yet again, uh, my two main problems with it are, one, it basically allows the ship to be sunk without the Citadel being penetrated, because it does not have enough reserve buoyancy, which is a principle that goes all the way back to HMS Warrior. The idea there having been that if the ship's unarmoured portions were completely riddled, the Citadel would still be able to keep the ship afloat. Most battleships present in World War II have this capability. If you don't penetrate the Citadel, then in buoyancy terms at least, they won't sink. There is, of course, a possibility that uneven flooding will cause the ship to capsize anyway, at which point more water will come in and then it will sink. And with Bismarck, you have a twofold problem. One is there's not enough reserve buoyancy within the Citadel to keep the ship afloat, period. And secondly, because of the way it's shaped and because of its height, the Citadel, even if it remains unbreached, in fact, especially if it remains unbreached, may, means the ship is more likely to capsize than others because of the low level of that turtle deck armor being slightly above to slightly below the waterline, depending on where on the slope you are, before any flooding takes place, it means that if the ship takes on water above that turtle deck, through main belt penetrations or leakage from fore or aft, then the water is going to pool as the ship rolls, which, thanks to the free surface effect, will make it, it even more unstable and make it more likely to capsize than a ship with a straight flat armoured deck, which is most of the all-or-nothing type design battleships of the period. And before anyone says, oh, but Drac, the Citadel is so long. Yes, I know. I've calculated the total internal volume. It's still not enough. Um, for one thing, you know, the, the length when the ship's 
hole is getting narrower and narrower the further out you go is in no way shape or form compensation for a nice high citadel amidships where the ship's hull is quite wide and secondly um somewhat more basically i suppose look at the height of the citadel relative to the waterline then realize of course that when the ship is at a normal displacement and that's not normal displacement as in the measure as in its its normal working displacement Everything below the waterline is already displacing water to hold the rest of the ship up. That's how displacement works. Essentially, almost all of Bismarck's citadel is already under the water, which tells you without having to resort to complex area and volumetric calculations that that citadel, because obviously there are parts outside of the citadel that are also underwater, essentially cannot really contribute to holding the ship up further once additional flooding comes in. But anyway... If you readjust the design to an all or nothing scheme and get rid of that silly upper strike, then by having a box design similar to the US fast battleships or the British King George V and Vanguard, you can save an awful lot of weight or you can use the same weight to create a better armor scheme. So maintaining belt thickness and the ship's overall displacement I was able to increase the main belt, the 12.6 inch or 320 millimeter thick belt, by height to 6.5 meters instead of the previous 5.4. Or if you don't like a particularly high belt, that's fine. But uh, again, by just taking off that upper belt and rearranging every the deck arm into an all or nothing flat top box scheme, it's also possible, retaining the original armor belt height, to now, with the spa spare weight, once you've all or nothing the entire armor scheme, to have the maximum thickness of the main belt increased to 360 millimeters, which is about 14.2 inches, which would make the ship pretty well protected, I would dare say. And the deck armor sitting on top of that belt, which is now a deck higher than it was before, can be 150 millimeters thick because, of course, this is Germany. So we're working in whole millimeters and that's 5.9 inches thick, which you know, is pretty substantial protection there. And my cross-sectional longitudinal and overall strength values, just in case you're interested, are now 1.02, 1.12 and 1.03. So I'm still doing better than the original design. And then you have the main armament. So this is the third on the list, so it's the least likely thing I think the Kriegsmarine would actually have gone for. But this is the layout of the main armament. I'm not going to change the caliber. 15 inch is pretty good. It's a very powerful gun in and of itself. Just try and solve some of the issues with the fuses if you don't mind. But every German capital ship, or what they thought at least was a capital ship in the case of the Deutschlands, post World War I has had a triple turret. Now, of course, there were political reasons for selecting the 15-inch gun. There were political reasons for selecting the twin turret. But, you know, they've got experience building triples, so there's no reason not to. Or three-gun, yes, I know, technical term, but triple is just easier to say. And so my proposal reaching a little bit now would be to, instead of having four twins, go for three triples. Now, this will, of course also involved persuading Krupp to design a breech block that will allow you to have a slightly saner gun spacing, which would be quite nice, and, you know, basically redesign the interior of the turrets. They're massive, they're incredibly wasteful, but everyone else is able to produce triple turrets of varying descriptions on reasonable footprints. The Italians have done even triple 15s on reasonable footprints, so I'm sure Germany can too. Now, if you do this, you have a number of interesting options. My default for the Spring Sharp project is simply to replace the two forward twins with forward triples and eliminate the super firing, so Caesar turret position, and increase Dora to a triple. So that's a fairly conventional three triple alignment. Now, of course, that gives you an extra gun and allows you to overall shorten your citadel because although the individual magazine spaces are larger thanks to our wonderful friend the square cube law it's actually easier to have three magazines and the barbettes etc for triple turrets in terms of overall length than it is to have four twins now without changing anything else in the spring shops and just changing the turrets 
we've returned our strength overall, although we've reduced our displacement slightly, even though we've got the additional gun, because of course fewer turrets, our overall composite strength has gone down a little, but we were ahead before, um, and now, because we're keeping with our 105mm secondaries, our cross-sectional strength is back down to 0.99, which is what it was originally. Our longitudinal strength is 1.13, which is 0 0.04 better than it was originally, and about the same as what it was with our revised 4-inch design. And so our overall has returned to 1.0, which is fine. But of course, there are other things you could do with uh, this concept, playing around with it a little bit. You could, if you've eliminated Caesar position, potentially fit another three 105 mil mounts in, one on either side and one super firing where Caesar used to be, pretty much like on the Scharnhorst. Now, of course, that will add a little bit more weight to the proceedings, but it gives you another four guns on your already 14. Um, so you are now up to 18 barrels per secondary broadside, which would be quite nasty. Uh, you could play the Königsberg card and have the two triples aft and one triple forward and basically repeat the process up front. Or if you don't want to change your secondary battery at all, but you want to just play around a little bit and have some fun, you could do a, a German Littorio style, as you can see here, with the aft triple still in Caesar position, which gives you huge amounts of deck space aft where Dora was and going on further to the stern. What exactly you do with that is, of course, entirely up to you. You could stick torpedo launchers on there, a la the Deutschlands, like Admiral Graf Spee. You could move your aircraft handling facilities back there. You could stick some light anti-aircraft guns back there. You could just leave it open as a tennis court or something. And, of course, with either the default just using Dora as a triple or using Caesar as a triple, whichever one you want to go for, you will, in fact, because you're shortening the overall citadel length, also be saving weight on your armor, which means you can go on further to make your citadel higher or thicker or a compromise situation of both, depending on what you want to do. But either way, we're still either as good or better than the original design in terms of composite strength, except now we have considerably better anti-aircraft firepower, a single additional anti-surface heavy gun in the form of an additional 15 inch gun and we've got better armor protection at keeping enemy shells out in the first place. So those are my big three main changes. Now smaller changes these are going to be pretty quick and pretty easy to be perfectly honest. Firstly forget having the multiplicity of unarmored cables for redundancy in those last few levels going up to the primary rangefinder. Instead just go with British and American approach. You mean the Germans have already taken the armoured tube most of the way up the superstructure. Take it the rest of the way. And that way you won't lose your fire control immediately that somebody lands a heavy battleship shell somewhere in your forward superstructure's vicinity. That's pretty quick and easy. And the other change that I would make is the 37mm anti-aircraft gun. You know, the bolt action 37 millimeter anti-aircraft gun just no it's it's not good now again a navalized fully automatic 37 millimeter anti-aircraft gun would be a little bit time off in coming on land versions exist that could be repurposed but sticking with a slightly conservative line of thought i would have just gone with you know if our only options for medium tier or medium weight anti-aircraft firepower are bolt action 37 mils i'd rather just not have them and have more 20 millimeter and while we're at it since we're completely reworking the light and medium anti-aircraft batteries replace the 20 mil and bolt action 37 mil with a bunch of flak veerlings okay quad 20 millimeter mounts they're not going to necessarily reach as far as 37 millimeter but 37 millimeter is so abysmally slow you're probably never going to hit anything with it anyway so does it really matter just stick a bunch of quad 20 mils on there at least you've got a quite a nice battery at that point of numerous barreled light anti-aircraft firepower 
until the day somebody invents a fully automatic 37 millimeter or you know just go over to Bofors because Sweden is neutral and buy a production license for the 40 mil of course that means you're gonna have to figure out how to mass produce it the same way that the US had to but you know it's an option so those would be the smaller changes I'd make there are some others I've mentioned one of them in passing where do you put the aircraft doesn't really make too much odds in terms of the ship's survivability whether it's a midships whether it's aft you know personal preference i think the one big one that you're probably all expecting me to say is the propulsion system of course Bismarck historically had a triple screw propulsion system most battleships of the time had a quadruple screw propulsion system would changing that change anything probably not Yes, the triple screw system does have a number of weaknesses. The biggest one from an engineering perspective is the fact that it causes a much sharper rise in the stern, which makes the stern more likely to collapse due to damage, which is a problem that quite a few German ships in World War II had. However, even though it has actually happened to Bismarck as well, realistically looking at how Bismarck performed whether it had triple or quadruple screw propulsion probably wasn't going to change an awful lot yes as has been said before if she had quad pro screw propulsion as opposed to triple steering via the propellers would have been slightly easier but on the other hand USS Marblehead an Omaha class cruiser had four screw propulsion and had a jammed rudder after she was bombed so very similar circumstances to Bismarck and although she could steer somewhat with her screws the minute the wind or the currents went against her she basically didn't have steering so whilst swapping over from triple to quadruple screw propulsion might give you a margin more in terms of agility and you might also have a slightly less vulnerable stern it's probably not going to change all that much in the grand scheme of Bismarck's historic story. Now, admittedly, in Bismarck's precise timeline, about the only change that we've made that's likely to have any major effect on whether or not she lives or dies is switching out the secondary battery, because now there's a slightly better chance of hitting the swordfish. But outside of that, I think we've created a much better surface combatant. We've got more anti-surface firepower, we've got more anti-aircraft firepower, we've got heavier armor, we've maintained our speed, and all it's cost us is a conversion to all or nothing armor and taking a small leap of faith in ditching the heavy anti-surface battery. Now, what you think about that, obviously some of you will let me know in the comments below. And if some of you either want to play around in Ultimate Admiral Dreadnoughts or in Spring Sharp itself and see what you can come up with based on the original Bismarck file, then, well, feel free to let us know how that goes. And I look forward to seeing it. Until then, see you again in another video. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.